I had a history professor one time who said, the past is the past. History is how we interpret it. And I think that applied to me, and I think it probably applies to all of us, where our past is our past, and our story is how we interpret it. And this slide right here, uh, it is my story. For the last 18 and a half years, uh, I've been invested in trying to become the best leader that I can be in the hopes of trying to build other great leaders that can build cohesive teams around trust and who can adapt to fight and win in any environment. And when I use the terms fight and win, sometimes you know they sound very militaristic, but ultimately what it means is fighting is taking those tactical actions every day, those small events, those small leadership efforts every day, cumulatively, to ultimately win, meaning that you're linking those to your higher or your strategic purpose. And as I continue to do that, and Dr. McEchin's speech was fantastic today because he talks a lot about with veterans and service members, the warrior and the professional are the two worlds that I feel that I've lived in. And many of us that are in the service feel that as well where I ultimately have to be able to fight and serve for my country, but I also need to be a professional leader in my own right. And so comparing and contrasting those two environments or those two worlds, that ultimately is the, is, is the secret sauce, the hidden secret to being successful in our world, in the service, over time. But what I tell the young leaders in my program is if your decisions do two things, You'll always be successful if they do these two things. If your decisions as a leader accomplish your mission, whatever it is that you're assigned, and the second thing is if it takes care of your soldiers, if you safeguard the lives that you are responsible for, if your decisions do those two things, then you'll be successful as a commander, as a chief executive officer, as a leader in any walk of life. And this philosophy is what I've used for the last three and a half years as the leader of the Southern Strike Army ROTC program across all of South Florida to try to develop young leaders that can fight and win in any environment. And as I reflect upon this, it helps me make sense of the experiences that I've been through. Because I've been challenged and I've been tested like all of us have and faced adversity. And so capturing those lessons learned and transmitting those to the young people that will follow in my professional footsteps helps me to make sense of what I've done. And for a long time, though, I thought this only had application to military leaders. Um, and recently, I realized, you know what? If I don't share this, then what am I as a leader? Because ultimately, building leaders across our formations, across our industries, across our countries, around the world, is ultimately going to lead to a better, stronger, safer world that we live in for the future, for the future of my children, and obviously for the future of yours. But as I look back on this, it's taken me a while to get there. And this really is not a lot of original thought on my, on my behalf. A lot of it is looking at other leaders and what they thought and what they demonstrated. Because the leader-led relationship, I think, is very unique and it's very special. And really, it's the act of leading that connects those two entities. And it's always framed by the context of your environment and where you are in time, space, and purpose and how you connect those two things together. And leading, the actions that you take become so critically important to actually having influence and impact every day which is what my goal is and hopefully the goal of you as well. This time here was 2005, 2006. I was a Longbow Apache attack helicopter company for the Bravo Company Bearcats of the 1st to the 101st of the historic Expect No Mercy Battalion. It was what I thought was the ultimate job to have in the Army. I'd been blessed to have a phenomenal team that I was in charge of leading. We had prepared for a year and then we had deployed in September of 2005. I'd gotten married about a year earlier. Our first daughter was born about three weeks before I deployed. I felt like this was my time to make my mark. This was when I was gonna prove myself as a leader. As Alex said before, this was gonna be the fire that I was gonna be tested under. This photograph here was taken later on in my deployment out in the western of the desert, flying aerial combat patrols, 
interdicting and disrupting smuggling operations that were happening between Syria and northern Iraq. The same area that's contested space recently with ISIS and other engagements that we've had. We launched out of Fab Talafar, which is just west of Mosul, and we were doing a lot of aerial interdiction operations, where ultimately I'm responsible for making a decision whether to land a UH-60 Black Hawk with 11 soldiers on board, and having those soldiers dismount, and ultimately my decision could be the decision that decides whether you know, their fate and whether they survive or not. And so the level of responsibility that I felt at that time uh, was immense. But I felt like I was prepared for it, and I felt like this point in the deployment later on, these missions were very effective, but they were not in large part viewed as being high-profile strategic level missions. But in my opinion, they were the most successful missions we flew that entire year. Because I had learned from some failings of mine early on. I had learned from some very pivotal and very gut-wrenching experiences early on where I viewed my leadership differently. I didn't see my leadership as being myself and my crewmates. I saw my leadership as that platform. I felt that my influence was more about the projection of power and less about the empowerment of others. And with a helicopter, it's very unique, and I use it as a metaphor for a lot of my leadership, because you're flying in the fuselage in the cockpit, but that's actually not what you're flying. You're actually just riding along. What you're actually flying is that rotor disc on top. The inputs that you're making on the controls aren't actually happening where you think they're happening. They're actually happening offset, and they actually take effect 90 degrees later because of that rotor disc that's spinning around over your head. And ultimately, you realize that you're actually leading above yourself, figuratively, but also literally, because the inputs that you're making, they have an effect on you, but it's after it's been routed through the forces that are around you. Forces like lift versus gravity. Forces like thrust versus drag. Not to mention the forces of courage versus fear. And so you learn a lot through this experience, and it taught me a lot about myself. And in these missions, I always framed them as a movement to contact. Every mission we flew, regardless of what it was we were going to go accomplish, maybe a convoy security, maybe an aerial reconnaissance, everything was a movement to contact. A movement to contact is an attitude. It's where you're launching out every day, and the environment is volatile. It's uncertain. It's complex. It's ambiguity, amb ambiguous. You don't quite know where the enemy's going to be, but you have to be ready for everything. And it makes you have this sense of having to be anticipatory, where you're trying to think two or three steps ahead because life in the world is flying by at 100 miles an hour, and you've got to be laser-focused not just on your teammate, but as well as what's happening on the ground. We would set up traffic control points, interdict vehicles based off intelligence-driven operations that had been conducted, to try to disrupt the enemy. And disrupt and deterrence are sometimes hard to quantify in any industry, in any environment. How do you quantify disruption or deterrence? In my line of work, it was much easier to quantify destruction. How much battle damage are you doing to the enemy? What, how lethal are you? How effective are you in those terms? My crucible experience was on December the 20th of 2005, about six or seven months previous to this photograph. We were doing a standard aerial combat patrol along MSR-1, which is Route Tampa, which is the main maneuver route that goes all the way from Basra all the way up through Baghdad and then all the way up into Mosul and continuing northbound. It was our main traffic route. We had launched out with two Longo Apaches, always a lead and a wingman, had linked up with our initial convoy, and then got the call that we got repeatedly. Troops in contact. Bearcat, troops in contact. Hard Rock AO, need you to push to the east. We make up the radio call. We immediately push down to the lowest unit that we can get a hold of, and we connect directly with the soldiers that are on the ground. And it was Executioner 1-6 was his call sign, and I don't know, I didn't know his name, I didn't know his rank, but I knew his call sign because we had worked with him before. And we had continued to support them on multiple operations throughout that, throughout that deployment 
through September, October, November, December, through the winter months. We had gone over to secure them. They had taken, they had taken contact from an enemy formation in a very tough, hardened, insurgent network that was operating just north of Balad, just to the east of Samara East Airfield uh, in central Salah and province. We immediately arrived on scene. We provided security for them while they were con conducting their operations. And as soon as we arrived, the fire stopped, the enemy fire stopped. We were able to neutralize the threat for them. We provided security. We continued to maintain overwatch. And then we continued to support them while they started their maneuvers back towards their forward operating base. As we had come around, I had gotten in contact with them, and we had always cleared the route for them. And I said, hey, the route looks clear. And we had gotten another radio call about a troop in contact to the north. And this was sort of standard procedure at the time. You just bounced from one, from one contact to the next contact to the next contact, so you were always anticipating what was going to happen next. So we departed, we departed their scene, and I had my wingman take lead. He tuned up the next frequency for the next unit that we were going to check in with, and I maintained up executioner's frequency. And I monitored it just for a couple more minutes. And as we were flying northbound, I heard the radio call that I hoped I had never hear in my entire life, which was screaming Americans on the radio that had just been, that had just encountered an IED. They started screaming for help on the internal radio, Bearcat, Bearcat, we turned around, we came back to their location. I could immediately see the black plume of smoke, I could see the Humvee ripped in half with the flames, I could see them running around the chaos that was occurring on the ground. We immediately pulled security for them. We neutralized the threat. We called in for the ground QRF, the Quick Reaction Force. We immediately got a hold of every aircraft in the air, had them come in, do the medevac, do the Kazavac, called in suppressive fire for the next six, seven, eight hours after that. We fought all day long with those soldiers on the ground. But, the, but in the end, two soldiers died that day. And it was the first time that soldiers had ever died on my watch, where I had failed them. I was there to protect them, and I failed. We continued the mission. We went back after that mission was done that night. I continued to fly the next couple days, because after adversity hits downrange, the best way to cope with it is to continue to focus on the mission. Continue to focus on the mission. That's what's going to get you through it. So I flew the next couple of days. I was the company commander. I expected myself to continue to be out there, but it ate away at me. It ate away at my soul and the stain that I had felt for feeling as if I had, I had cost them their lives. Three days had passed, and we flew back to Samara East Airfield, where they were at, where their company headquarters was at. And we landed, and, and we went to the fallen hero, hero ceremony to honor those two soldiers with all the men of their company. Uh, and we observed the ceremony, and afterwards their company commander came over to me and was like, hey Craig, I'd like you to come talk to the guys. And, I, and my three warrant officers that had been with me that day, that are three of the, the finest aerial warriors that I will ever serve with and will ever fly with were with me that day, and any success that came from that mission was because of them. I agreed and we went over there and we talked to those soldiers and I went there to apologize. I went there to tell them how sorry I was for not staying a little bit longer and making sure that they got home safe. And when I got there, I got the response that I never thought I would get from them, which was they were hugging us and thanking us for everything that we had done. They felt like so many other missions we had helped save them, whereas I thought that I had failed them. And I learned so much from that event because the leadership that you display every day, you may not ever know you're making an impact with it. You may never know that you're getting through. You may never know that you're having an influence for good. What you see is you see the negative, as horrific as it may be. But it's the small things that you do every day. Those soldiers had said on so many other occasions because of what we had done for them, they knew whenever the Bearcats checked in with them, they knew when they heard our rotor blades on the horizon, they knew they were going to make it home that night. And that's not just for my company, that's for all the soldiers, all the great Americans that have been downrange, that have had Longbow Apaches and other aerial weapons platforms come support them. It's that, 
bigger cat in the sky, that aerial warrior up above, and integrate it in with the soldiers down below that ultimately makes the difference. And as my battalion commander once said, ultimately your, 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 grade, your grade report is written by the soldiers that, that you fly in support of. They're the ones that are ultimately going to decide how good you are or not. The reason I share that story with you today, um, and whenever Doug was giving his talk, it hit home with me because sometimes veterans have a hard time opening up about their experiences because no matter how well I tell a story, a war story, I'll never get it right. I can never frame it in the context that it deserves. And all I really hope to do by sharing this story is to honor these fantastic heroes that I had the chance to serve with in the past and ultimately hope that I've been able to convey the lessons that they've taught to me for the next generation of leaders coming into the Army and into our society so that they can lead a better, stronger, faster, more capable unit, organization, company, team, family than I did. And if there's an idea that's worth spreading out of all of this, it's to not get up every day and wonder what you're gonna, what you're gonna be following, but lay, wake up ready to, to lead and go out there and live your life to lead and make it worth leading. Thank you.